Good morning again and welcome. And welcome to those viewing this online later today. As we gather today, we uh, commemorate Remembrance Day and Pentecost 23, the 23rd Sunday after Pentecost. We also acknowledge that it's the uh, National Aboriginal Day this day, the 8th, is, is specifically that, and we reach out to a particular uh, Aboriginal veteran, a canon of our diocese, Canon Victor Flett, who will view this video at a later time from his residence. And uh, we give thanks to all, for all veterans and all who made the ultimate sacrifice. So as we pro proceed through the service today, you'll hear parts of that. Matt Humphrey is at a, uh, a different service today with the uh, St. Matthias Church and the um, Emmaus community. So he sends his greetings today and is worshiping in a different environment for once a month. And as we gather, as always, we acknowledge and give thanks for the Wasanic and Coast Salish peoples whose unceded territories we worship on, and we journey in reconciliation and traveling well together is our continuing goal. So as we worship today on this beautiful, sunny, almost mid-November day, we give thanks to God and thanks to God for each other, and let us turn our hearts to worship. Thank you.
invite you to remain standing. In the name of God, we meet together on this Remembrance Sunday to thank God and to commemorate all who have served their country, especially in time of war, and in particular, those who made the supreme sacrifice. We have also come to pray for peace, for justice, and for goodwill among all people, and to dedicate ourselves anew to removing the causes which give rise to war. We thank you, Almighty Father, for all your mercies, known and unknown, for your guidance of your people in wondrous ways through our history, for the courage, bravery, and constancy of sailors, soldiers, air crew, for the devotion and fortitude of men, women, and children. We pray that we may be worthy of peace and show forth our thanks by serving you more faithfully. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Father of all, we pray to you for those we love but see no longer. Grant them your peace. Let your light perpetual shine upon them, and in your loving wisdom and almighty power, work in them the good purpose of your perfect will through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now, have a moment of silence. They shall not grow as we that are left grow. Age shall not weary them, nor the years in them. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them. I invite you to be seated and be attentive to hearing God's word. The children's prayer will come at the beginning of the sermon. <coughs> A reading from the 24th chapter of the book of Joshua. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel. And they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago, your ancestors, Terah and his sons Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates 
and served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. I gave him Isaac. Hear what the Spirit of God is saying. Amen. Thanks be to God. Please join me to again saying together Psalm 78 in your bulletin. <clears throat> Hear my teaching, O my people. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will declare the mysteries of ancient times, that which we have heard and known, and what our forefathers have told us. We will not hide from their children. We will recount to generations to come the praiseworthy deeds and the power of the Lord and the wonderful works he has done. He gave his decrees to Jacob and established a law for Israel, which he commanded them to teach their children, that the generations to come might know, and the children yet unborn, that they in their turn might tell it to their children so that they might put their trust in God and not forget the deeds of God, but keep his commandments. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. A reading from the fourth chapter of the first epistle to the Thessalonians. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so we declare to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who have died. For the Lord himself, with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Hear what the Spirit of God is saying. Thanks, Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand for the gospel. Lord be with you. The holy gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no, no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. And the bridegroom was delayed. All of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a shout, look, here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will be enough for you. There will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know, you know neither the day nor the hour. This is the gospel of Christ. Please be seated. Well, 
going to read a poem that is read in our schools at this time of uh, the year uh, as we take acts of remembrance. It's familiar to all of us, but it's good to hear it yet again this year. In Flanders fields the poppies blow, between the crosses row and row, that mark our place, and in the sky, the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead, short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunlight grow. Loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe, to you from failing hands we throw. The torch be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. I think at this time we take time to remember, obviously, those who fought in the wars that we have known and seen. We take time to remember those who are in our midst, those veterans who have seen war, and listen to them and hear about war from them. But now on the radio and in television, we constantly hear that we are in another war, a war against COVID, a war that all has affected all of us, and especially affected our children and their life and their teachers. I want to raise them up to you today because I think things will change as they face this war, as they learn how to come together and see the importance of the other in their lives, the importance of their person sitting next to them in their desk, the importance of the person teaching them, the importance of the person in their homes. And it is a prayer that the torch that is passed to them will put an end to all wars. To share this prayer. God of those who agree with us, God of those who don't, keep us from dividing the world into us and them, for or against, good and bad. Remind us that humans and human systems are always more complex. Choice of on, off, up, down. As you have met us in the reality of a living, breathing human being, may we meet each other as three-dimensional people and not as another yes or no. Bless, Lord, those who teach and those who learn. Bless parents during this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I felt more emotionally than I thought this morning in reading that poem. Um, I, I want that generation who were born after World War II, who grew up in the west coast of Scotland, a place called Greenock. The uh, Nazi bombers hit Greenock three times during World War II. And in each of those times hit significant parts of the, um, the town, the shipyards, the sugar refineries, and to great distress, the distillery. <laughs> and there are stories I grew up with because the war was still five years, six years, ten years after World War II. It was still very much in the lives of my parents, my friends, my family. We played as children in bombed out buildings. We played in air raid shelters. That was a reality that we grew up in. And um, the story, my favorite story is the day that they did hit the distillery and everybody came out of their houses with pots and pans and different containers <laughs> to try and save the stuff flowing down the hill. As I say, I've never had to fight in a war. I take great honor in the fact that I did serve in the Canadian Navy as a chaplain. It's a wonderful time in my life, and it certainly had an effect on me to be in the role of padre. There was an old Scottish minister in the parish in St. George's there, Doogie Kendall, who I said to him, so you served in two world wars? And he says, yeah. I says, what were you in World War I? He says, I was a jock. Flew in with the, or uh, was shipped in with the uh, Black Watch. And I said, what were you in uh, World War II? He says, I was a padre. 
He says, you'll have many titles in your lifetime, many titles as a priest, but you'll never have a greater one than Padre, because it's given with love. And I experienced that in my service. When I was a curate in the first parish I was in, at St. Matthias in Victoria, a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks before November the 11th Sunday, the then rector said to me, Logan, you're preaching on Remembrance Day, mainly because he didn't want to preach, but secondly because he knew that I had believed that those who follow Jesus as disciples are called to a life of non-violence, and he knew that I would preach on non-violence. Then he said to me, you're preaching on that day, but remember, there's three admirals, four vice admirals, a few generals and colonels in the congregation when you're preaching. <laughs> and so I preached on that day and was received well. Nervously, I was preaching that day, but was received well by those who had served their country in various forms, whatever their rank was. Because it's been my experience that those who experience war firsthand know that war must cease. Know that there must be other ways that we approach life on this planet. And they came up to me afterwards and said, thank you for that sermon. We have experienced violence, pain and loss. And there must be other ways for us to live our lives. Another role for us in our relationship. We take seriously the handing down of that torch to us from those who went before us. And we carry that torch proudly so that we will no longer or no, never again have to look at the pain and the violence of war. In 1942, November the 14th, 1942, there was a bombing raid over a, a city in England called Coventry. Hitler wanted to wipe out a British city and bring Britain to its knees. And Coventry was chosen, and the code name for the raid was called Moonlight Sonata. And the planes, the Luftwaffe, came over, and they bombed the city. And the city was massively bombed, flattened by the, the Nazi warplanes. Physically, but not mentally or spiritually. The famous cathedral in Coventry was flattened. The provost, or the dean of the cathedral, after the morning of the raid, walked out. And there's two symbols that are powerful, three symbols that are powerful for us that we have received. One was some of the big beams, the charred beams, were lifted up by him and others and put in the sign of a cross and put up on the, the uh, cathedral. The other ones, some of the large medieval nails and tied them together and put them up as a sign of the cross. And underneath there, the provost, the dean, took a charcoal stick and wrote, Father, forgive. Father, forgive. Significant. He did not say, Father, forgive them. But he said, Father, forgive. A powerful statement. Because later on in that same war, the Allied forces blitzkrieged Dresden with the same intent to destroy a city. A city that had no military uh, facilities, but was chosen as a symbol to try and defeat the Germans. After the war, those two cities came together, Coventry and Dresden. And from there, the community of the Cross of Nails was born, a community that was committed to the way of nonviolence, to the work of peace, to the work of reconciliation. In our cathedral in Victoria, there is one of those crosses of nails that hangs, and there's a chapel that uh, has been made a chapel of reconciliation. And on the, the chapel, it doesn't say, Father, forgive, but more in tune with where we are as Christians, where we live, it says, Creator, forgive. Creator, recognizing our relationships with First Nations. And I'm glad that Lauren remembered that today we remember 
the indigenous folk who went off to fight for, on behalf of this country. But that symbol remains there for us today. The work of the community of Cross and Nails is threefold. Healing the wounds of history, learning to live with difference and celebrating diversity, and building a culture of peace. Let me read these again for you. Healing the wounds of history, learning to live with difference, celebrate diversity, and building a culture of peace. The scripture this morning, the gospel this morning, allows us to enter into it in a number of different ways. We can enter into the traditional way, the way that we've known, the way as we move towards Advent, the celebration or the anticipation of the second coming of Jesus. That's a traditional way. There'll be enough time in Advent as the season approaches for us to live into that, watch, wait, anticipate, be prepared, get ready. But I want to enter into the scripture a little differently this morning. I want us to invite you to enter in the way that our Jewish brothers and sisters might enter in through Midrash. In Midrash, we'd ask questions of the scripture. We'd look at scripture and we'd say, what should have been said? What might have been said? What could have been said? As we look at that scripture. So let's take those folk who are there. And I think it's important that we think of them carrying torches, not lamps. Torches would be the best interpretation that they were carrying torches because the lamps at that time would not light anything outside of the building but a torch, they were carrying torches. So let's think about them and I want us to think about them in two ways. Firstly, I want to think of you to think about them in the relationship with each other. Those who have and those who have not. Those who have oil and those who do not have oil. Those who are the oil producers and those who long for oil to keep their economy going. I want us to think about those who are rich and those who are poor. I want you to think about Republicans and Democrats. <laughs> I want us to think about conservatives and liberals. I want us to think about groups that are different, that have history, that have pain, that have separation. And I want us to think about that in the sense of what might have been done here, what could have been done here, and what should have been done here. So we have a group who have the oil, who were prepared, who were ready. And what were they like? We might ask the question, were they smug in the fact that they had the oil? Were they arrogant in the fact that they had oil? Was it an opportunity for them to say, let's sit down and think about how we might work this out together? How we can share this resource that we have? That might have been a possibility for them. What about those who didn't have the oil, who the scripture tells us may have been lazy, or the scripture tells us that they were foolish? What about them? Was there a sense of entitlement with them? Was there a sense that we need this and you have it and you should give it to us? Was there a sense of openness? How can we work through this together? What we have in this situation, and what we have in every situation, is conflict. Conflict. The answer is always to how do we work through the conflict at a certain level. A level where we can change things, where we can improve things. Before that conflict becomes dispute, before that conflict becomes violence. There is always conflict. We live constantly in conflict. We have to learn how we deal with that each and every day. How do we look at others? How do we have that conversation? How do we have that dialogue with those who are different from us? For those who look at the world differently? Friends, this is a great question before the United States of America as they move forward. But it's also the great question for us in Canada as we move forward. It could have been Alberta and British Columbia. Those who see the economy based in oil and those who are looking at the environment. 
Those conflicts are there for all of us. They are there in our churches as we continue to live out the gospel of Jesus Christ. Different worldviews, different ways of looking at things. They are there in our families and in our homes. They are there in our lives. How do we respond to the differences that we live out each and every day? Those conflicts. How do we make sure that those conflicts don't rise up? The other thing I think is really important in this is that whatever happened, whatever the attitude that was there between those who had and those who had not, those who had not decided to leave, they left and went away. We really don't know why they left and went away. Was it they get fed up and says, to heck with you, we're not sticking around here anymore. We're going over to find our own oil. Did they leave in anger? What they discovered when they came back was perfection wasn't asked of them. Only presence was asked of them. Perfection was not. They were only asked to continue to be present with the other. If there's a learning from this piece of scripture, this gospel, I believe it's stick around, folks. Don't leave the table. Stick around. Don't leave the table. We, as you know, have a number of children. <laughs> we had seven children. Six girls and one boy. The good news for us is that we're never seven living at home at any given time. <laughs> the most we ever had living at home was five. And Marsh and I, being only children, grew up in households where you couldn't talk about religion, you couldn't talk about politics, and you couldn't talk about sex. So we thought we would be open-minded and we would allow our children at the dinner table to have conversations. We tried as hard as we could to have one meal a day when we all gathered together and we were all sitting together at the table. And those conversations were there, let me tell you, because there was conflict at the table between political views, between religious views, and having uh, six girls, there was far more conversation about sex than we ever wanted to have in those situations. <laughs> there were no rules, really. Conversation was open, the dialogue was open. Uh, they could uh, speak about anything, they could argue, and they could leave the table when they felt that it was becoming too difficult for them to stay at the table. They could leave the table. And they would leave the table, flying the plates down or the forks and knives down and stomping down and banging a few doors as they left. But they had to come back to the table. They had to come back and they had to work through what had happened and build reconciliation with the rest of the family. Staying at the table is so important for us. Staying at the table in our homes, with our family, with our friends, in our churches, politically, in the world in which we live. The opportunity to continue to speak the truth and listen to the truth and hear it. That doesn't mean we're, we are in some way humble and we don't say anything. We say what we believe and others say what they believe and we sit at the table together. That's the learning, I think, from this. Because if they had stayed around, they would have been in the wedding banquet. If they had stayed around, the question is, did it really matter if their lamps or their torches were not lit? But they would have been in the wedding banquet. They missed that opportunity to be at the table, to celebrate the feast. So as we remember those who went to war, those who fought so that we would have peace, those who stood up in times of conflict and violence and oppression. We realize that the torch has been passed on to us, to this generation and to future generations. And how will we live that out in the political realm? How will we live that out in our churches? And how will we live that out? in our homes. Will we heal the wounds of history? Will we learn to live with difference and celebrate diversity? And will we, sisters and brothers,
continue each and every day, wherever we find ourselves, in homes or shops, in community, to build a culture of peace. That's a torch that's been passed on to us. Will you pray with me? God of those who agree with us, God of those who don't, keep us from dividing the world into us and them, for or against, good or bad. Remind us that humans and human systems are always more complex than binary, choice of on and off, up and down. As you have met us in the reality of a living, breathing human life, may we meet each other as three-dimensional people and not as yes or no. Amen. to stand in mind, body, and spirit as we confess the faith for our baptism as we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Ken will facilitate us in a time of prayer together, be as is your tradition for prayer. Let us pray. Let us pray for Christ's holy Catholic Church. In our Anglican cycle, we pray for the Church of the Province of the West Indies, for Justin, our Archbishop, Linda, our Primate, Mark, our National Indigenous Archbishop, Melissa, our Metropolitan, and for the Anglican Church here in Canada. In our diocesan cycle, we pray for Anna, our Bishop-elect, for Ansley, the diocesan administrator. We pray for the clergy and people of St. John the Divine Courtney and St. Andrew Sandwick, and for the clergy and people of the Diocese of Caledonia. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In our parish, we pray for our ministers, Lon, Matt, Logan, Brett, Bob, and Lori. We pray for all who are helping the parish to stay safe and well, and we continue to pray for our outreach programs. We pray for the worldwide Christian church, for the other Christian churches in our community, remembering especially the clergy and people of the Roman Catholic Saanich Peninsula Parish. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We continue to pray for all those affected by the coronavirus outbreak around the world and for the safety of all who are helping the victims. We pray for peace and healing in the United States following their divisive election campaign. We continue to pray for all who have been or continue to be victims of discrimination, racism, sexism, and violence. We pray for the victims of the attacks in Quebec and Vienna in the past week, for those killed and injured in the earthquake in Turkey, and for those affected by the hurricanes in the Caribbean and the Philippines. We also pray for effective steps in dealing with homelessness, drug addiction, and mental illness. And we continue to pray for those affected by conflict, disorder, economic and social turmoil around the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. <clears throat> we pray for those who are ill in body or in mind, and for those dealing with personal challenges and issues, and for those who are known to each of us for whom prayers have been requested. We pray this week in our parish for Kathy and John, Cheryl, Lisa, Mark, Henry, Nick, Madeline, Audrey Q, Gladys, Tony and Margaret, and Neville. We pray for those in our parish with long-term needs, Ken B, Erica, Margaret, Sherry, Ted, Ed B, Pat M, Doreen H, and Brenda. We also pray for friends and family beyond the parish whose names are listed in the bulletin, adding also Peggy, Chuck, Emily, and Philip Stewart. And if there are any for whom you are concerned, please mention their names now, either silently or aloud. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
We remember before you, O Lord, all your servants departed this life in your faith and fear. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we commemorate Remembrance Day today, let us pray for all service people and veterans with the following litany for peace. We pray for all who suffer as a result of conflict and ask that God may give us peace. We pray for the service men and women <clears throat> who have died in the violence of war, each one remembered by and known to God. We pray for those who love them in death as in life, offering the distress of our grief and the sadness of our loss. We pray for all members of the armed forces who are in danger this day, remembering friends and all who pray for their safe return. We pray for civilian women, children, and men whose lives are dis disfigured by war or terror, calling to mind in penitence the anger and hatreds of humanity. We pray for peacemakers and peacekeepers who seek to keep this world secure and free. We pray for all who bear the burden and privilege of leadership, political, military, and religious, asking for gifts of wisdom and resolve <clears throat> in the search for reconciliation and peace. O oh God of truth and justice, we hold before you those whose memory we cherish and those whose names we will never know. Help us to lift our eyes above the torment of this broken world and grant us the grace to pray for those who wish us harm. As we honor the past, may we put our faith in your future, for you are the source of life and hope, now and forever. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Remember, Lord, all your people. Strengthen all who are in tribulation, necessity, or distress. Remember for good those who love us and those who hate us, and those who have asked us, <clears throat> as unworthy as we are, to pray for them. Remember especially, Lord, those whom we have forgotten. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, hear our prayer. prayer. The service continues in the bulletin. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. God welcomes sinners and invites them to this table. Let us confess our sins confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we might delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all of your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you to stand as you wish. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us share that with one another. Peace. Peace.
Gracious God, your word to us is food indeed. Receive all we offer you this day, and let your loving kindness be our comfort for the sake of Jesus Christ, your living word. Amen. God is here. Lift up your hearts and minds. We give thanks to God the Creator. Holy and Eternal One, in whom we live, move, and have our being, you are our origin and our fulfillment. We praise and thank you for drawing us to this sacred meal. From the ocean of your primal love, you fashioned the marvel of creation and beauty of human life. From this land of towering forests and mist-laden coastlines, you humble us and affirm the sacred gift of all creation, calling us to care for everything given and received. From the earliest days, the people of these islands and inlets learned their dependence on your provision, salmon and deer, song and ceremony, dance and painted cedar, hallowed these sacred relationships with all life. In Jesus Christ, you came into our world to reveal your glory, reconcile all peoples to yourself, and make all things new in him. Now, gathered from many places and joining with saints of every time and place, we raise our thankful voices as we say in unending praise, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you, most holy one, for on the night before he died, Jesus took bread. He gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to all gathered and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup, gave you thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, God of all creation, we lift this bread of life and this cup of salvation. Send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts and upon us that we may know Jesus in the breaking of bread and follow him in lives of selfless service and courageous love. In the fullness of time, reconcile all things in Christ and bring us to that heavenly table where every tear will be wiped away and we will feast anew. Blessing, praise, and thanksgiving be to you, holy and eternal one, undivided trinity, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior taught us, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Creator of all, who summons the salmon from the depths of the seas to yearn for the place for their origin. My friends, these are the gifts of God for us, the people of God.
shared for us. Living God, in the Eucharist, you fill us with new hope. May the power of your love, which we have known in word and sacrament, continue your saving work among us. Bring us to the joy you promise. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God, whose love working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, and the blessing of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you, those you love, and those for whom you pray, today and forever. Amen. Let's go in peace to love and serve God.